Hello and welcome to the UK eSports Speaker Series presented by the University of Kentucky Federal Credit Union. My name is Christina Walker. I'm your host for today and I'm super excited because today we'll be discussing video games. In particular, we'll be looking a little bit at the history of video games, some of the pro-social benefits, and also we'll even be getting into the long heated debate about whether video games actually incite violence in the real world. So without further ado, our guest speaker for today is Dr. Anthony Lynn Perils. He is the Associate Professor and the Associate Dean of Graduate Studies in the University of Kentucky's College of Communication and Information. He specializes in media effects, video games, and instructional communication in so many other areas. So I guarantee you won't want to miss this. Stick around. Again, welcome. Hello, everyone. My name is Anthony Lamparos, and I'm an associate professor in the Department of Communication and also the associate dean for the graduate program in communication here at the University of Kentucky. Growing up, I was probably like a lot of you. I love to play video games. Any chance that I got, I spent hours and hours playing. You can imagine how surprised I was when I was toward the end of my undergraduate studies at Kent State University and I realized I could make a career out of being a video game researcher um, as a communication scholar. It's something that I thought about then, um, something that I continued to do when I went on and studied for my PhD in mass communication at Penn State, and something that I continue to do now as a professor here at the University of Kentucky. Today, I'm here to talk to you a little bit about my own research, but also broadly about the positive and negative effects of games. The effects and the social effects and psychology of video games is a hot button issue. Uh, there's a lot of research, there's a lot of uh, debate, and there is a lot of perspectives on whether or not the games can have positive and negative effects. We're probably somewhere in between, but my hope is through this talk today that I'm able to distill a rather large argument down to one that's easily uh, understood and digestible for the audience. So let's dive right in. So those of you who don't know me, have never run across me, I taught COM 101 last semester. As I mentioned, I'm a professor, an associate professor in the Department of Communication. I'm also the director of our graduate program. But um, one thing that a lot of people don't know about me is of my 27 uh, peer-reviewed works that I've published, 13 of them focus on the effects of video games. And so when we talk about areas of expertise that we have as communication faculty, I can solidly say that my research program is in the area of video games. How did I get started on this? Well, I'm a video game fanatic. I grew up with video games, and when I found out that I could make a career out of this by doing research, I got really excited. So before we get into talking about the positive and negatives of video games, I want to talk and first give you a brief history and an overview of the industry and tell you a couple other fun facts that you might not have known. Despite the fact that we refer to video games as a new type of media, the first video game was actually invented in the United States in 1958. This is important because while we think about consoles and mobile gaming as the way that we interact with games today and the way that you always have, this game was actually invented in the Brookhaven National Laboratory where they were doing nuclear research. So nuclear research wasn't popular enough for visitors that were coming to tour the facility, they were actually kind of bored. And so what they did was they used an oscilloscope to create the first Pong game. Um, and that was done in one of our big scientific laboratories here in the United States. 1972 is when the commercial foundation of the video game industry sort of begins with Atari 2600 and Magnavox Odyssey. Those systems go on to become commercially successful in the 1980s, late 70s, 1980s. For reference, I was born in 1981. And then um, in the early 1980s, we have games like this, which are so wonderful. It takes me down memory lane here to see games like this. So this particular game, Space Taxi, is one that uh, my friend Jimmy, who lived on the block, had. And he was the rich kid because his parents could afford this game. We all would go to his house and play it. Wonderful graphics, huh? <laughs> so you get the idea. In this game, basically you're a space taxi and you're driving around and you're picking up uh, fares and you're dropping people off at different points in space to make money. 
Uh, along with games uh, like this that were, this game was for Atari and Commodore 64, we also had DOS games. The video I've included here is a game called Defender of the Crown that I played on the first PC that my grandfather got us in like 1986. I think I was five or six years old and I was playing this game called Defender of the Crown. But one thing I do want to tell you guys, the modern day video game industry, we know it is this sort of juggernaut, but it wasn't always like that. In fact, in the 1980s, the mid-1980s, the industry was nearly dead. So when it became very popular, a lot of people raced in to uh, make games, and they made a lot of cheap games, a lot of games that people don't like playing, a lot of imitation games, and, and things that just flooded the industry. And so it was nearly dead, but something came along and saved it in around 1987, to about 1990 and you guys probably all know what it is but it's a Nintendo Entertainment System that was brought to us by Nintendo out of Japan. Moving on, the rest is history because where we're at currently is that there's 2.4 billion players worldwide which is a staggering number and according to the uh, Entertainment Software Association which is the foremost authority for industry statistics, 75% uh, of US households contain one person who plays games I would guess that average is probably up right now in the middle of a pandemic. You guys might find yourselves playing games more often than you normally would. Average age of a game player, despite people thinking this is child's play, is actually 33 years old. It's 32 years old for a male and 34 for a female. Uh, if you're looking at this, it's because uh, this, this age demographic trended upward because my brother, who's going to be 42 years old here, I actually know, gosh, I lost track of how old my brother is. He's going to be 43. He's the one that introduced me to games, and he has all of his game systems. So that demographic between 20 and 45 contains a ton of game players. Um, even though games are known as more of a male pastime, it's actually normalizing more. We see almost a 50-50 split now between the demographic makeup of game players being male and female. Some numbers for you. Presently, 2020. Um, the industry will generate $152.1 billion worldwide. If we break that down by market, uh, the Asian Pacific or Asia Pacific region is number one, um, China, Japan, so forth, followed by North America and then uh, Europe after that. The mobile gaming market makes up a, a, roughly half of that worldwide revenue. And to give you an idea of sort of why video games are such an important thing that we want to study and know more about, if you look at Grand Theft Auto V, that game itself had $1 billion in sales in the first three days that it was available. Uh, it was released years ago. Now, uh, for comparison's sake, the top grossing movie takes two weeks to make a $1 billion. So if you think about all the great movies that we've seen over the years and the ones that are the top earners, we have video games that can generate that revenue in, in three days. It's just amazing. I don't have to spend a lot of time on these, but I just want to quickly go through the game genres so that you guys are familiar with the genres that are uh, the ones that we know and accept and the ones that are emerging. So we have our sports titles, very popular. In fact, other than first-person shooters, sport games are the number one seller. First-person shooters are first. We have our classic racing and driving games. We also have simulation games. So I know many of you here may have either built a city, as I did when I was growing up, using SimCity. Or maybe you lived a different life playing uh, The Sims 4 where you actually created a person and you nurtured that person and had a family and everything else. We also have flight simulation games. This bottom one, we have strategy games. This is actually one of the Age of Empires games, uh, True Story. I actually spent four days playing Age of Empires when I was a freshman in college to the point where I didn't leave my computer. I actually had people bringing me food. I don't think I showered for a couple days now that you have that uh, terrible visual. Um, uh, <laughs> I just want to tell you that even though I make fun of some of the stuff and talk about it in my research, it's actually things that I've, I've lived, uh, li lived through and so forth. We've got our shooting games, as I mentioned early, earlier, um, wildly popular games. Our fighting games, another popular genre, your Mortal Kombat's, uh, Street Fighter, uh, action adventure games. So those probably come in a close third place with role-playing games as well, um, like World of Warcraft still being wildly popular. But these are the widely accepted genres. Um, we had a moment uh, in time uh, quite a few years ago from about 2006 to, I'd say, about 2011, 12, where we started to see other sort of game genres emerge. So Rock Band, Guitar Hero, Dance Dance Revolution, and Wii Fit. Um, I don't think these games are as popular as they used to be, but it's worth noting they sort of fit this other category. 
And then we have more modern successes like Fortnite. I'm sure a lot of you in here have played Fortnite or maybe gotten addicted to playing Fortnite. But a massive open uh, game where you're uh, fighting on teams and, and, you know, fighting for different goals. I've only played a handful of times. And um, the reason I stopped playing is because I found it to be incredibly addictive and I couldn't waste my time. Games have come to a point where they're so ubiquitous that even our own university here, uh, the University of Kentucky, is now, uh, well, hopefully was planning to launch their uh, eSports program in the fall uh, 2020 semester. I'm not sure how everything going on now will affect that, but it's something I'm really looking forward to, something I've had a lot of conversations about, and something I think will, that will be great for Kentucky. But not only do we have our classic genres, but we have this different mode of playing now, which will be eSports. So I'm going to shift away from the game genres here and talk briefly about the uh, entertainment software rating board rating system for games. And so you guys have all probably seen these little things on game boxes or other places where ratings appear. But one thing I wanted to note here is that vid the video game industry is a self-regulating industry. And when I say it's a self-regulating industry, what I mean is they do not want the government involved and the government has never been involved in terms of regulating the content that's in video games. And so, for example, um, if a game gets produced, so Rockstar produces a new Grand Theft Auto game, they send it to the ESRB, the ESRB assigns it a rating system and sends it back to Rockstar, right? And so, do you guys know that the only, uh, the only rating that is not acceptable for commercial video game releases is this adults-only rating here at the bottom of the screen, the AO18+. If a commercial game was to get that rating, one that was going to be played on your classic PlayStation, Nintendo, or Xbox platforms, or uh, widely on mobile, the company that's producing that game would take it back and retool the violence so they could get the much more palatable, mature 17 plus rating. The only time we end up seeing AO ratings on games is because um, those are usually computer games, more for the uh, adult uh, population, and ones that usually contain content that would be found widely objectionable for most of the people that play these mature 17 plus games which are teenagers and uh, young adults and people like myself and so this is self-regulation it's governed by the video game industry it's much like the motion picture association of america rating movies and um, the industry self-regulates there have been a handful of times when states have brought suit and tried to ban violent video games for the mature content and it's gone all the way up to state supreme courts and even the supreme court of the united states and it's always been found that violent video games are protected speech so under the first amendment they're protected speech so i don't think that the government will be banning video games anytime soon when we talk about the major players in the game industry uh, I like to compare the current generation of consoles that we're in, which is the 8th generation, and contrast it with the past generation, which was 7th gen. So as you can see right now, in the handheld area, and we're talking about, I think every kid has a 3DS, Nintendo dominates that market. I can't believe PlayStation even still produces a, um, a handheld system. It just seems like a futile effort at this point. I don't know why they still try to play in that industry. But when it comes to the general consoles, as you can see, PS4, is uh, the top selling console in compared to Nintendo Switch and Xbox One, which have the same, roughly the same percentage of market share. If we look at the previous generation, we could see that although PS3 and Xbox 360 were popular, Nintendo dominated with the Wii. Um, they sold over 100 million uh, units, and um, they also were selling their DS to the tune of 150. 3.8 million units. So Nintendo has sort of ebbed and flowed and kind of brought the video game industry back in times when it's waning. But we all have we also have our stalwarts like uh, PS3 here or PlayStation, Sony's PlayStation. Actually, the top selling system of all time, and it might be surprising to some of you, is actually the PlayStation 2. So that's a little bit about the industry. I want to transition now into talking about what I study. And not necessarily these particular things that I study, but why we study video games and what I also do in that particular realm. So the rise of video games also gave rise to the concern about games. And so anytime a new type of media has appeared in society, uh, we tend to scrutinize it to the point where we think it could be all the ills of society or can contribute to a lot of bad things. So in the 1980s, we had the first popular commercial games appearing and we had arcades and stuff like that. There was a lot of concerns among society and researchers alike about delinquency, addiction, and socialization. So if kids are spending more time 
playing video games. They're not going to be doing schoolwork. They might become withdrawn from society. And early research actually did show that people that were spending more time in the video arcades had worse grades and subsequently acted out more at school. Um, the rigor of that study is in question, but just to give you an idea what the early stuff looked like. The 1980s gave this, and the 90s gave a lot of concern about violent content causing aggression or other antisocial behavior. That's something that we're going to talk about here in a second. Then the 2000s and beyond, um, we got concerns about everything, but more attention uh, has been given to the potential pro-social impact of games, and there's been a more holistic focus on playing processes and experiences. But it is worth noting that if you ever consider doing video game research, either for a commercial enterprise or an academic enterprise such as the thing that I do, um, there are many areas that are still insufficiently researched or we just don't have enough knowledge to make uh, any kind of claims about. And you'll hear me say that quite a bit here as I trudge through this research. And so here are some of the major areas of games research. We've got the violent video games and aggression, probably one of the most popular. Um, the addiction and problematic use, something that is far more uh, of a concern in other countries than it is here in the United States, but it's something worth noting. In other countries where professional gaming has been uh, the pastime for more than 10 years, for 15 years in fact, there have been some really serious uh, news stories about people playing games to the point of exhaustion and dying, or playing games to the point of neglecting a child and a child dying, like some crazy stuff. We have a little bit softer stuff like just general motivations for playing, um, something I research quite a bit, which is gaming technology. The idea of serious games, so games that have a purpose that uh, actually are catalysts for positive outcomes. Advertising in games and avatar uses. This is no, by no means a comprehensive list, but it's just to give you a flavor of some of the major areas of games research. What are some of the variables we look at in games research? Well, I like to talk a lot in variable language because... I have a quantitative approach to my research, so when I think about research questions, it's always independent variables and dependent variables. So when we think about games and how we could look at this, look at the first one on the list, game content, right? We have game content that's more pro-social, we have game content that's more anti-social. We have some violent games where you can toggle the blood on and off. Does that make a difference? That's something that we could actually do research on. And so we might take a game like Mortal Kombat, keep the blood turned off, and ask people how they feel after playing. Or we might turn that blood on and then ask them if they're more aggressive or if they feel more aggressive after playing. So if you go down the list here, there are different social and psychological variables. Think about tech features. I've done studies myself where I've put people uh, playing a racing game with a steering wheel or playing with a traditional controller or playing with some other type of apparatus to see how it influences their game playing abilities, um, their enjoyment of the game, and so forth. We have exposure and time spent playing, mode and type of play. Of course, I just told you guys about competitive gaming. We can play solo. We can play with other people. We can play on a network, co-located. There's a whole bunch of different ways we could vary those independent variables, which would then impact the dependent variables, which could be your cognition, your mood, your behavior, or your general perceptions. So to branch out a little bit and talk about this, when we think about video game content, first and foremost, something that's been scrutinized and attacked a lot over the years, many content analysis, even though you guys can see that some of these are dated, and the reason why they're dated is because people stopped doing research when they found out what the content of popular video games was, right? And so all these content analysis show that like, I don't know, anywhere from 70 to 80% of the popular games, the most popular ones at any time when you pick on that list, are going to be games which contain violence. And when we think about violent content, it's important to think about the kind of things that people were concerned about when I was growing up and the kind of things they're concerned about now. And one of those things, perhaps, is the realism, right? So the games have become much more sophisticated, so people are more concerned about content than they were um, at other points in time. But I'll tell you this, parents, groups, society, um, political leaders, all these folks, they've been concerned about content even when it looked like this and what it looks like now. So... Here's an example of what Mortal Kombat looked like when I was growing up. Fight. Excellent. Ooh. Intense stuff, guys. So I remember when I was playing Mortal Kombat and it looked like this when I was a kid. And I think my dad showed up downstairs and was like, what the heck's going on with this? Like, we can't have you playing this game. And now look where we're at. This is the current uh, Mortal Kombat game. And, uh, of course, I'll warn you here, there's some violence in here. It's a little bit more intense than the violence you just viewed. Three strikes and you're dead, Kano. 
I only need two strikes to gut you. Know what? That was strike three. Fight! Oh. Okay, you guys get the idea. That violence is pretty intense compared to the violence of the past, but the concerns remain the same. I also have a Call of Duty compilation there, but the takeaway here is that violent video game content is the norm. All right, so because it's the norm, there's a lot of public concern about violent media, and it's not new. It's been around forever, right? People thought comic books were gonna be the end of society. They thought television was gonna be the end of society. And similarly now, video game violence has taken front uh, center stage here when it comes to talking about uh, tragic things, especially school shootings. So video games have been connected to the Newtown shooting, Columbine, Parkland, and other mass shootings. In fact, these pictures you see here in the corner are uh, the Columbine shooters, and it was widely reported that they played modded levels of doom that look like their school to prepare for the shooting. Um, I'll tell you here why that's a slippery slope and why we can't really say definitively that these games are indeed the catalyst for violent behavior. But regardless of what we think, we have political leaders that say things like this. A lot of bad things are happening to young kids and young minds, and their minds are being formed. And uh, we have to do something about uh, maybe what they're seeing and how they're seeing it, and also video games. I'm hearing more and more people say the level of violence on video games is really shaping young people's thoughts. And then you go the further step, and that's the movies. You see these movies, they're so violent, so you hear the President of the United States saying that it's games that we need to be concerned about. Um, here's another clip that actually is one that's closer to home. People died there at the shooting at Marjorie Stoneman Douglas High School. And we're learning more about the victims. You can see some of them here in these pictures. Kentucky's Governor Matt Bevin actually responded to the Florida high school shooting with a call to action. He says it is not just up to the government, but he's also calling out media. I'm calling on anyone who's in a position of influence, every superintendent, every CEO of every media company that produces a video game that is violent in its nature, the movie producers who make the movies, the record producers who produce the music that we listen to, all of you, we've got to step up. We're the adults, let's act like it. Kentucky, of course, is still recovering from that school shooting at Marshall County High School in January where two students died. You guys can see here former Governor Matt Bevin and our current President Donald Trump both saying something very similar in terms of pointing the finger at the media. So should they be pointing the finger at the media and is there any validity to that claim? Um, well, I'll tell you this. We certainly can't have it both ways. I can't say on one hand that violent video games are nothing to worry about and then on the other hand say, well, serious, really pro-social games can be used for positive outcomes. Well, let's look at what the research says. There's a lot of meta-analytic meta, meta evidence as it relates to violent video games and aggression. The first thing I want to point out is when we talk about aggression, we're talking about a multifaceted construct, right? So there are different types of aggression, right? One of them is physical aggression, and that's a really awful type of aggression, right? Somebody's hitting somebody, somebody uh, shooting or stabbing, a physical aggression. That's probably the worst one. That's also the one that's hardest for us to study. We can't bring people into a lab, expose them to violent video games, and then have them perpetrate crime on someone. So we have to have other ways of measuring that. And so the point of extrapolating or pulling that concept out and talking about it is because all the other types of aggression, like hostility, verbal aggression, um, and so forth, those things happen all the time in society. You could be out in traffic, somebody cuts you off, and you see people beep into horns, screaming at each other, flicking people off. People are just naturally um, sometimes dis disposed to aggression. It has nothing to do with video games. And again, since that stuff is prevalent in society, is that what we're most concerned with? I would say no. But what the meta-analytic research has shown us is, if we look at the bottom of the screen, the effect sizes range from 0.15 to 0.40. 0 0.40 for context, okay, that's on verbal aggression. So if we had people playing violent video games and becoming verbally aggressive, that effect size equates to about explaining 16% of variance in that outcome aggression. So that means that there's 84% of a bunch of other stuff that's not explained um, and aggression by violent video game play. That's one of the most most robust effects that we have, okay? 
And so that's very small. It's a very, that we call it a medium size actual uh, correlation, but it's actually very small in the grand scheme of things. When we look at some of the things for physical aggression, like how do games lead to physical aggression, the percentages become a lot less. Anywhere from 3 to 6% of physical aggression might be able to be explained by media in general. That's a very small piece of the pie when we think about what we're explaining, okay? So there's this guy out here named Chris Ferguson, who's a widely recognized expert. I've actually met him before. I've talked to video game research with him. And we're going to contrast his perception on things with uh, these folks here. I'm not going to skip ahead. But they're the other side of the argument, the one that believe that B Bushman and Anderson basically believe that violent video games are very problematic. And Chris Ferguson says there's nothing to worry about. In fact, one of his more recent books here, uh, moral combat. He, it's why the war on violent video games is wrong. So he says that these meta-analyses that we have are imperfect. And why they're imperfect is because this very reason. I've done studies on violence, uh, violent video games, and aggression. And you know what? I've not found anything. If I submit that for publication, guess what happens? It never gets accepted for publication because I don't have any effects. Right? I'm basically saying there's nothing here. And even though that's a really important thing to say, um, a lot of journals aren't going to publish it. So he, even though Anderson and Bushman have tried to correct this publication bias flaw that could be present and saying like, hey, I'm only looking at studies that show effects, um, Ferguson still says it's a mess. He also says we have unstandardized measures of aggression. He's right. So Anderson and Bushman, the folks I'm going to talk about next, they say that they know what the best practices are in this research. But I tell you right now, it's hard for us to actually use some kind of measures, uh, outcomes in a study to actually understand what's happening with especially physical aggression. Some of the measures of aggression I've seen are paper and pencil. I've seen people using an air horn to blast noises at people, crazy stuff to show aggression. The other point that Ferguson makes, he says well, there's a near perfect negative correlation between the rise in violent video game play and real crime or aggression. So right now, at this point in time in history, we probably have more people playing violent video games than any other point in time in history. But what else is going on right now? Violent crime, especially, is lower, right? Especially amongst the demographic this is supposed to be affecting. So while it might seem like there's a mass shooting all the time, or there's other types of uh, violence that's being taken out in mass. Um, it's actually not the case, and that's what Ferguson points out. And then he says that these effect sizes that they say are kind of liberal, <laughs> um, he says when we control for other factors, the correlation becomes zero. So I told you guys 3 to 6%, up to maybe 16% of different types of aggression can be explained by violent video game play. Ferguson comes in and says when we account for all kinds of background characteristics and other things like that, the correlation becomes zero, essentially saying that's inconsequential. So what do Bushman and Anderson say about this, the guys on the other side of the coin? Um, Bushman and Anderson say that they have established expertise that basically exceeds what Ferguson's knowledge is, right? They say methodological rigor, so the way the studies are conducted, takes precedence over publication bias. So, for example, Bushman and Anderson might look at the study I did on violent video games and aggression and say, well, guess what? Your study is flawed because you didn't do it right, so therefore it's not going to get published, and that's more important than whether or not it got published in the first place. They also really say that effect sizes are important even if they're small, and they compare and contextualize the effect sizes they found with violent video games and aggression with other public health things like um, safe sex and uh, STD transmission and smoking and cancer. There are really small effect sizes there, but they use that to contextualize the importance of their research. They also couch that by saying exposure to violence can be easy to control. They say ban the violent video games. If you ban the violent video games, that's a really easy thing to do and society will become better, right? And last but not least, they say clearly over and over again in their 20 plus years of research that violence is causally linked. Exposure to violence, all types of media violence, but especially video game violence is caus uh, causally linked to aggression. So what do I think about all this? I will tell you guys this. It's an ongoing debate, and there are many more studies that find effects and knows what's are negligible. But there's a lot of problems, some that I just mentioned, right? So methodological issues, measurement issues, causality is a huge one. We can rarely ever say anything is causal. In fact, you'd be a bad social scientist if you run around telling people that you found causal um, inference between, say, playing a violent video game and aggression. Because even though we might say they're ca uh, causally linked, we can never for sure say anything is 
causal unless we can explain all the variants. And in our social science studies, we rarely explain all the variants, right? One researcher, Patrick Markey, a colleague of mine from Villanova, um, here's a clip from CNN. You guys can watch it on your own time. He doesn't come down really hard on either side. He just says he wants people to be more careful and thoughtful with their research. And I feel the same way. I'm not saying that video game, violent video games are nothing. Like I wouldn't give my four-year-old son violent video games and tell him to go nuts because I just wouldn't do that because uh, he could be at his age when he's still learning and everything like that, it could be detrimental. So I'm not washing it out and saying they're nothing to worry about, but I also think that the public alarm and actually some of the research alarm that we face over this is kind of overblown. So what's going to happen ultimately? Um, I will just tell you this. I published an article. I tend to think that Ferguson makes a lot of good sense. And do violent video games always have to cause violence? Um, I would just say no, right? So Ferguson focuses on a lot of other variables that would predict people's propensity to violence, things like personality variables, family situation, other contextual factors as being stronger predictors of violence than exposure to violent media. And he's shown this in a lot of his studies. And then a paper I published in 2013 with a bunch of other collaborators who also study video games, uh, Ed Downs from the University of Minnesota Duluth, uh, Jimmy Ivory from Virginia Tech, and Nick Bowman, who's now at uh, Texas Tech. We actually elaborated the, artic uh, the argument that violence in video games actually causes people to become disinterested, to have an appreciation, and think about their own morality a little bit more. And I won't play this game for you. You can play it if you want, but it's actually kind of a, an old Flash game called the Torture Game where you can basically torture somebody. Um, it's actually not somebody. It's not a person. It's like a doll that's hanging up, but you can shoot it and do all kinds of crazy things. And at first, when you start playing, you're kind of like, oh, this is weird. But the more you play it, the more you're like, what am I doing? Like, just like when you play Call of Duty and you got to go shoot up an airport, you know, it's not the idea that you go out and aggress after that. You would instead go, what the heck's the matter with me? Like, what kind of human being am I playing this really violent game? And so when we elaborated this argument, we were trying to get people to think about other things except for the, the sort of um, one way or another argument that often gets played out in the media, which is violent video games have to be something to worry about or they're nothing to worry about. Other content concerns, sex and sexual violence in games, that's upped in recent years. Um, of course, network games, a lot of trash talking that happens on those. And I say we need to keep doing more research or, or we're going to continue to just get crap. And I'm talking about not only the research dialogue, but also the popular dialogue that takes place. And so here's a clip that I'll play for you guys. Now let's discuss whether there is any link between violence on the screen and real violence with Ben Shapiro, editor-in-chief of The Daily Wire, and retired Army Lieutenant Colonel David Grossman, who's authored books on the psychology of violence, Army Ranger, Black Belt, and everything. Okay, you, you, you win just on that score. Uh, it's great to have you both on. Um, let's start with you, David, because uh, some of these games are really wild. I mean, they're, they're pretty graphic, pretty gory. Uh, you know them, you know, Call of Duty, Call of Duty, Call of Duty. I don't re do any of these, but what like Grand Theft Auto? Yeah, they're actually, simulated, simulated it's a, violence, it's a criminal simulator, murder simulator. Yeah, Evan Ramsey, um, others like uh, you know other, some of these other killers, Dylan Klebold, uh, Eric Harris of Columbine yeah. were steeped yeah. in these games. Adam Lanza, the Norway killer, trained on those. He said he trained on them. Sixty-nine dead on island in Norway, and he spent a year training on video games to prepare himself for this crime. The killer at uh, in Florida, he, he spent 15 hours a day on violent video games. The most all-consuming, all-pervasive thing in this guy's life are these violent video games. And it, less than a year ago, the American Psychological Association made a definitive statement. There is a clear, unequivocal link between violent video games, violent behavior. Their blood pressure goes up, their heart rate goes up, violent actions go up. The data is persistent and clear across many different forms. You cannot deny it. It, it is overwhelming. Ben Shapiro, uh, I know you're skeptical about a link from video games. Yes. Millions and millions of people play these video games. I mean, girls aren't as into these video games, I'm sorry, as boys are. <laughs> but but I, I think if my sons had access to them, I'm sure they'd play them all the time. Because something about the boy's brain and these games. But why are you not worried about it? 
Well, I mean, I, I'm not supremely worried about it just because the consumption of these violent video games has been going up continuously since the early 90s, and yet youth violence has been going down since the early 90s. The correlation actually doesn't fit. Uh, as far as individual instances, I mean, y you can find patterns in, in, sp in very sporadic instances uh, among virtually uh, all data sets, but th there's some pretty mixed data about this. It's true that the American Psychological Association recommends that parents not allow their kids to play these games. I wouldn't let my kids play these games because I think they're immoral, frankly, but that should really be up to parents. I'm not sure the government should be in the business of stepping in. In 2011, Justice Scalia, in a majority decision 5-4, found that it was actually unconstitutional for the state of California to regulate the capacity of parents to be able to get these video games for their kids, or even for kids to get them themselves without parental permission. You saw that as a content violation under the First Amendment. Um, I have no problem with people having a spirited debate and talking about this, but if you go on to watch that entire clip, I think it gets kind of ridiculous. And I do think that um, some of the stuff is not based in uh, actual data and actual evidence. So I will tell you guys this. While that is probably the most, uh, the area that overshadows games research the most, the positive, uh, I mean, the negative side of it, the aggression side of it, that's where most of the research has been done. There's a lot of good research being done on the pro-social benefits of games as well. And so most of you probably grew up in a school system where you played some type of educational game as part of a curriculum. Um, that was probably the first time you were exposed to an educational game. We now have games that teach people how to care for certain conditions they have, diabetes, heart disease, things like that. And we also know that the military uses a lot of simulation and gaming to train um, our soldiers as well. So there are some pro-social benefits of games. When it comes to what I do, um, although I have dabbled in some of the violence research, uh, I've also looked at narrative in video games, advertising in games, also exploring tech features, but I've also published six studies on uh, extra gaming. A couple of years ago when I arrived at the University of Kentucky, we actually did a little local feature on some of my extra game research. And I will tell you this, the same questions that motivated me to understand if violent video games could cause aggression were the same sort of questions that were motivating me to understand if we have exercise games, we have home exercise, what will make those games a better catalyst for producing exercise, positive benefits, learning potential over per se another type of media maybe like a home workout video and stuff like that or just having a home gym or going to a gym and i found a lot of encouraging results of course people aren't playing extra games as much as they used to when i was doing a lot of this research but i formulated a lot of models and i um, have found that these games can influence people toward positive healthy behavior influence their intentions to exercise more and so forth if you are interested in that research just contact me and i'd be happy to talk to you about it um, i could spend a whole hour talking about it so it's good to know or it's important to know that there is a lot of positive stuff going on out there, stuff that I publish myself, aside from the general stuff that you see the most, um, the negative stuff that's on the news. So where is it, do I believe the future of games research is going to be? Um, I still think that the video game industry, even though it's slowed in recent years, is going to continue to be a juggernaut of entertainment. I think the mobile gaming industry still has a lot of growth potential. Uh, many of you guys that don't think that you are actually video game players probably do play mobile games and probably never thought of yourself as a game player um, when you were just playing a game on your phone, but you are a game player. Um you know, mobile gaming and then esports, right? Esports isn't really a platform, it's more or less a context. But if we look at esports and mobile gaming, we don't have a lot of research that accompanies those. Most of the research that's been done has been done on computer and console games. Um, I don't know that the research will change all that much, but it makes it exciting to have uh, other things to research that are up and coming. Another thing that we'll have to think about in the future is our old media theories that we have that we try to apply to things like video games tend to be not applicable when, in terms of the way the scope fits, right? So video games, even though they're a form of entertainment, they're an interactive and engaging form of entertainment that are probably more active and engaging than, say, playing television. So does that mean we need to explain, have new theories to explain how people play games? Not necessarily, but it does mean we need to think outside of the box and possibly build new theories around this medium. And as I said before, while we have so much research on the negative effects of games, I'm starting to see a lot more focus on the positive and people trying to think about how we can use games to increase educational outcomes, learning outcomes, 
and uh, even something like esports. That's a pro-social thing, right? I mean, it's competition, but it's something that can be used for the good. So I much more would like to be talking about the pro-social benefits than the negative ones, but it's important to think about all of it together because a lot of the arguments um, sort of overlap one another. Well, I appreciate your time today. Even though I wasn't able to be with you in the flesh, I am so happy that I had the opportunity to do this. I also uh, will invite any of you guys that have any questions to please contact me. Um, I'm not that hard to find. Hello, hello, everyone. We are live. How are you guys doing out there? How are you doing, Dr. Lamperos? I'm doing wonderful. So happy to be here. Thank you. Thank you so much for all the information that you shared. So we are going to get right into the Q&A. I just want the audience to know that if you want to insert any questions in the chat, go ahead and do so, and we will get to your questions. If we have time, um, there will be a segment where we can look over those questions, and I think that Dr. Limperos will be happy to answer those for you. Absolutely. So the f thank you. Thank you. <laughs> All right, so the first question that I wanted to ask, and just excuse me from the beginning if you see my eyes kind of moving, because I'm, I'm reading. I want to make sure I get these right for you. Um, so this is a really broad question, and um, this is about communication in general. So a lot of people that may be unfamiliar with communication, just the discipline, um, they're kind of unsure exactly what it actually is. So sometimes I hear people say, well, yeah, communication, okay, speaking and writing effectively. But, right, we know it's so much more broader than that. Um, so can you provide some clarification on this so that people can understand exactly how communication can connect to, like, research interests like your own, like, video gaming and media and so forth? Sure, absolutely. Well, you did nail that speaking and writing effectively are probably two of the best skills that you can get from a uh, communication program and getting a communication degree. When we talk about the communication discipline, basically um, at its core, communication is about studying the creation, delivery, effectiveness, and ineffectiveness of messages, right? And so, of course, messages are rife with a lot of different things, common symbols, signs, behaviors and things that we can study. And so um, at its core, we study messages. At the University of Kentucky in the Department of Communication, we have five different areas of communication study that we offer. Uh, business and organizational comm, health, um, health communication, sport communication, human communication, which is a little bit more broad, focusing on interpersonal communication and so forth. And then, of course, the digital and mass comm track. Uh, as it relates to the communication discipline, how I got into video game research is because a lot of what we do in communication involves understanding uh, psychology, right? To understand message effectiveness or to understand what we're doing right and what we're doing wrong, we have to understand psychology. And so in the media realm, um, we're preparing students to work in media and audience research, um, to be mass media critics, to be good um, with deciphering public information and putting good information out, uh, media education, literacy, and political campaigns. And so when we go back to the games, um, of course, there's a lot of different places where psychology, communication, message design, technology, and everything sort of interacts. And actually, it might surprise people, but I was a generalist. Uh, in undergrad, I did interpersonal communication. I did some work in PR. Um, I had some other work experience that I did. And then when I started focusing on video games, um, it was just sort of a natural transition because communication researchers are so flexible that we're well equipped to approach things like games and really try to understand the social effects of them. So, Wow. Wow, that's awesome. That's a lot of information. I think that would be helpful to people so they can know and they can also look into communication and know how broad it is uh, going forward. Uh, so next question here. So you talked about some of these amazing statistics, right? Like there are 2.4 billion players worldwide with an average age of 33 years old. And then also the industry is generating over $152 billion worldwide. So with that, my follow-up is about careers because that's what everyone wants to know, right? Um, so there's been some questions about whether there are actual viable opportunities for career entry and growth in this industry. And personally, I'm thinking, of course, there is, right? Because there's financial progress, popularity. We see that in the numbers. Um, but what do you think? Can you tell us um, and those who are thinking about exploring this industry um, what your thoughts are about this? 
Sure, that's an excellent question. And I will say that, of course, I don't have, um, I've never worked in the game industry. Um, I know a lot about it. I write a lot about it and I read a lot about it. Um, but I would break it down into three kind of major areas where you can find uh, careers. So the game industry has a lot of the traditional technical careers. And when I call them the traditional technical careers, I'm thinking of things like design, uh, being a programmer, um, and the artistic and creative side, uh, game engineering, um, writing, uh, you know, the narrative for games, uh, technical support. Those are the kind of traditional careers that sort of dominate or still part of the game industry. Then we also have research related careers, um, game testing, usability. That's a big deal. Of course, in recent years, we've seen a lot of games that get rushed to market. They're unfinished and they're commercial flops because people hate them. They're like, why were you releasing a game <laughs> that we need to finish? <laughs> um, but so there's a lot of research related careers. And then there's the emerging careers, as I call them. Of course, you have careers in marketing, games and uh, video game journalism. Of course, we have um, a person in our college, Nathan Stevens, who's been a part of this series that runs a, um, uh, a review website, as far as I know. Um, we have public relations, of course, social media outreach. And then, of course, with the eSports initiative, something that we couldn't say when I was growing up that we can say now is you could be a professional gamer, right? <laughs> um, <laughs> that's not something that uh, in my wildest dreams I thought was possible. And, of course, that's still a more popular thing overseas, but um, it's something that's becoming uh, even more popular here. So, of course, the possibilities are endless. I knew I threw a lot of, in a lot of information in there, but um, there's, there's a lot of... Uh, potential careers out there in the game industry. Awesome. 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 Well, that is a lot of great information. <laughs> okay. So as you mentioned, there is a great debate about whether video games actually incite violence, right? And if I understand you correctly, you were in agreement um, with Ferguson while also drawing on other findings and your own research. Um, so you were looking at, hey, there's things that contribute to that, like the propensity towards violence and personalities, your background, all of these things that when coupled together, they may have the ability to contribute to violence possibly, but it cannot be said affirmatively that that's the case um, and that video games alone lead to violence. Is, is that where I'm seeing you going with this? Yeah, correct. Um, that's correct. Okay, okay, great. And then so with that said, for those college parents who may be hesitant about their kids, like taking interest in esports at the university level, what further advice can you offer them maybe with regard to some of the positive effects that you mentioned or things that they can actually control as far as their college age kids or themselves? Sure. That's, an, that's another great question. And I just want to real quickly mention that when I talk about and synthesize the research relating to violent video games, I do bring a little bit of my own perspective because as much as, uh, as much or as little as I've done in the area, I'm very well versed in the main researchers, the arguments. And, you know, even though it seems like I side with one over the other, I think all the science is good and it's all part of the debate and it's all necessary for us to make conclusions. And so when we talk about college kids and parents being hesitant about their kids being super involved in games, I'm going to I'm going to nerd out a little bit here for a second. So there was a study, pretty interesting study that was done a few years back. I'm trying to remember the author's names now. Where they were talking about, they studied an entire freshman cohort at a small college, looking at their time playing games, uh, you know, spending time with console games, other kind of games and so forth. And their working hypothesis, hypothesis at the time was that people who play more games are going to do what? They're going to be, they're not going to progress academically, they might have other issues adjusting and so forth. And what they found in this research was actually the exact opposite. The game players had better GPAs, got into less trouble. They weren't abusing substances much than the non-game players. And they had better retention from year one to year two. And so before anybody takes that, it goes like, oh, it's a rosy picture here. We don't have anything to worry about with games. I'm not saying that. But I'm saying when it comes to college age kids, we're nearing the end of the cognitive development here. And so most of those kids are, are in better shape. So when it comes to younger audiences, though, it's worth mentioning when younger yeah. populations are studied, whenever there's an addictive component of games or people are playing for lengthier amounts of time, there have been, there's been a lot of research that's shown 
um, that, uh, that that can actually be negative, right? So it can have a negative impact on studying, scholastic achievement, and so forth. So for college-age kids, I would say there's a lot of upside, but for younger audiences, maybe uh, be a little bit more cautious. And okay. the last thing I wanted to mention is that when it comes to esports, um, like regular sports, and we might even touch on this here, I'm not sure, I can't remember if we're going to touch on it, but um, building of teamwork and leadership skills is something that, uh, you know, just like regular sports, I was heavily involved with athletics a long time ago, and I remember that really gave me um, an understanding of how to work with people. And so uh, I think those skills can be developed in the game environment, and there are studies to support that as well. Awesome, awesome. Okay, and continuing to move on, let's see what we have here next. Okay. All right, so this is kind of a racy question. Uh, do <laughs> you right. think <laughs> do you think that we should be having competitions for high school students that include violent video games? I know that's a big question here. Um, yeah. Some controversy, of course, over the esports genre and you know all of that going on. Um, you know, with yep. UK being a part of that. Oh yeah, and, I, and here's the thing. I mean, it is. Anytime you mention violent games and, you know, the audiences that will be playing them, it's a hot button issue because there's a tendency to see some of the news clips that we watch during my presentation and other things where people just sort of say, this is the way it's going to be, right? We oversimplify it. But when we talk about high school students, because they're, they're minors, a lot of them are minors, and they're probably, when we talk about mature games, we'll be playing the mature 17 plus rated games. Um, that decision would need to be made with parents involved. Um, I will say that from the time I was in middle school, because I have two older brothers, maybe even a little younger than that, <laughs> I played violent video games, right? <laughs> and I played with yeah. not just my brothers, I played with a bunch of the friends. We had about 10, 12 of us that would get together on our block where we lived, and we'd all play those games. And so whether or not they're playing within the confines of the school, uh, I still, think, still think people are going to be playing the games. But since it's a school district, potentially, theoretically, that we're talking about, and it's not in the confines of home, it becomes a little bit more complicated. But once we get to um, college-age kids, I know there's a fair amount of debate uh, when it comes to that as well, but if you know, you're know you allowed to go watch an R-rated movie whenever you want, um, and again, I know it's association. We don't want to have association with things that could be attached negative st uh, stigma, but the bottom line is people are going to be playing these games. So whether they're sanctioned or not, people, people are playing them, and they're playing them in mass. <laughs> so... Um, High school, maybe a little more complicated. Getting older, maybe not. But again, that's not my, uh, that's not for me to say whether the university or a school district should endorse that kind of stuff. <laughs> yes, yes, I definitely understand. Um, that was really good information. Um, I definitely understand your perspective. Okay. Thank and so you, we're yeah. going to go, we're going to go ahead and continue to move along with the question. Thanks. Wonderful. All right, so let me look at a good one for you here. Okay. So can you expand on some of the areas of gaming that deserve more research? I know you said that um, some of the research was lacking in specific areas. Can you expand upon that for us? Yes, and every time I say that, um, I think it applies even farther than just video games, right? So there's a lot of things we study in communication where we have good predictions that we make about the way we think human behavior might unfold, but we can always do better. And so when we look at something like the violence side of games, which undoubtedly casts the biggest shadow or takes the biggest footprint, even though we have sort of these big summaries that we can draw on both sides, the fact remains if something is going on, that is problematic that we haven't thought about or we haven't looked at, of course, we need to continue to do that research because at the end of the day, um, even though I don't believe games are, are something to worry about, uh, even in relation to other media content, of course, with some things attached to, to that, um, some qualifiers, um, I still think that we could, if we could learn more about it and games were something that we'd have to worry about, we should expand that area. Um, pro-social aspects of games so if we think about it even though we like to demonize violent video games a lot of us grew up learning with games right different kinds of games that we had in school and the science might not always support that there's been some good science that supports games and learning but um you know we could always go a little bit farther there we could always do more longitudinal research so a lot of our studies tend to still be one-shot studies experiments or surveys but if we were able to do some more longitudinal research we might have a better understanding of uh, 
some of these social effects that we're seeing from games. I mean, I could keep going. One more I'll mention is uh, things like narrative. And so if I bring people into a lab to play a video game and I ask them how they feel about it, well, the IRB won't let me keep those people in a lab for three, four, five, six hours or a week so they could finish a game, right? So um, they come in, they play for 10, 15 minutes and they answer questions. But really the gaming experience is more holistic than that, right? Um, there's a lot of stuff that happens when you're playing a game, especially today's games with heavy storylines and things like that. And I don't know if we'll be able to do research on that stuff, but uh, we definitely need um, to have a better understanding because, of course, the more engaged and the more engrossed people are with things, the more intense the effects, if they're negative or positive, could probably be from those games. So, um, And then I'll just kind of throw it all into one. The big push with mobile gaming, networked games, uh, the research I feel like, you know, from what I know, still lags behind. So I think there's a lot that can be done there. But real, realistically, when you look at other academic fields and other areas of study, the good games research really only starts to begin in the 1980s. So we're not talking about a field that has, I mean, we've made tremendous strides, but there's still so much more that we could be doing um, as researchers. And, you know, um, if we had the time, I could just start drawing on a, on a board over here and we could just start to teasing out different variables and things that we could study in games. And you'd see real quickly that there's a million things to study. Yes. Yes. So Yes, definitely. I can see what you're saying. There's so many uh, things in so many areas um, that would encompass uh, video gaming and um, also intersecting other research areas. So that's pretty cool. Um, I think that is um, something that people want to hear, especially if you're interested in video gaming and also exploring it at the academic level. So thank you for that information. All right. All right. So to move it right along. So I know you did some research for extra gaming. Um, and you mentioned that you determined that the benefit with this particular type of gaming is encouraging learning about exercise. And then you also were proposing some potential ways that esports uh, competition um, could be used for good, um, such as aiding in educational outcomes. So, with that being said, in addition to these pro social benefits, do you think that esports can benefit teamwork and like relationship building? Um, and also, do you think this is beneficial, especially during this time, um, of course, where we're trying to come together and bring people of all backgrounds together? Yes. And uh, the short answer is yes. And it's tremendously important. And so uh, I will say that in my experiences, again, I'm not part of an esports team, but I've played a lot of network games and the concept is similar. Um, anyone who's ever played a networked game knows that there's a lot of trash talking and things that happen on those games, right? And a lot of stuff that's not rated content because you can't predict what people are going to do in an online space. But they do bring people together from all over the world. And even though I don't have a research study to tell you that it brings people together, I have my own experiences that I can speak of right now, which probably uh, mirror a lot of the experiences that anybody who plays network games uh, knows. So I don't have the time to play that I used to, but when I was in graduate school, uh, specifically with my PhD, because all you're doing is going to class, studying, and any free time I had, you know, a single, all I would do was just sit and play my video games. And during that time, I made friends in England, Brazil, uh, all over the United States. I never met any of these people, um, <laughs> but they were my community, right? They were the people that I would talk to at night about, you know, my day and problems and whatever else. It was like a mini support system. And so uh, having that experience, uh, and I know that if people are involved in the massively uh, the multiplayer online role-playing games like Warcraft and things like that, you end up developing, the, developing these friendships and relationships where, you know, if you think about what somebody might be doing, right? So we think, oh, is that a replacement for face-to-face -face relationships or whatever? No, I'm not saying that it is, but... Um, it's definitely a supplement. And when people might be introverted or they might be like me where I just was isolated, I didn't, you know, I was in a place and my purpose was to get my PhD. It was a really safe space to, to, you know, just get to know people and, and have a good time. And, and these things that you're talking about, like teamwork and relationship building, it's all a part of that platform. And again, it's easy for us not to focus on that because if you go and see, if you log on to any, 
<laughs> massive battle game right now and you listen to the dialogue that's taking place, you don't think there's anything positive that could be happening because it'll just be people screaming at each other and <laughs> obscenities and profanity and all that stuff. But um, really um, underneath it, there's a tremendous opportunity for community building, uh, one that I've experienced myself and I'm sure others have as well. Awesome, awesome. I am so glad that you can offer that perspective. Um, definitely now is the time for camaraderie, and I'm glad that esports can be that opportunity uh, to be able to present that for us and also um, research and video gaming. Um, mm -hmm. So with that said, that is actually the last question. We thank you so much, Dr. McCarles, for being with us today. And Wonderful. thank you to our audience. Um, we just want to let you know that you can tune in the first Thursday of every month for our speaker series, and you can tune in every Wednesday for Kentucky Esports Weekly. Please stay subscribed for information about tournaments and special events. You can go to uky.edu slash esports for this information. Thank you again, Dr. Lynn Perils. Thank you so much for having me. I appreciate it. Bye. Thank you all.